morning, everybody. Good morning. Depending on where you might be located, we'll give folks a little bit more time to come into the Zoom webinar this afternoon, and then we will get started. So just bear with us for maybe another minute or so. All right. Good afternoon once again, everybody. Good morning. If you're uh, super out west, thanks very much for taking the time to join this webinar for the Director for Technology, Innovation, and Partnerships at the National Science Foundation. Uh, my name is Erwin Gianchandani, and I have the honor and the pleasure of serving as the Assistant Director of NSF for TIP, as we call it, the new directorate here. Uh, and it's our pleasure this afternoon to present to you this webinar, providing you with an update on where things stand with TIP and specifically some of the new announcements that we've had, even just over the course of the last few uh, weeks in the first part of 2024, but also going back over the course uh, of the last uh, several months since the last time we were able to do this webinar for broad public consumption as well. Um, I'm going to invite you to please feel free to uh, take part in this webinar by putting in questions in the Q&A feature. Uh, we will try to answer some of those, uh, especially at the end, uh, but along the way as well, to the extent that we can. Um, and I would also encourage you to really try to think about ways in which you can engage with the various programs and activities and updates that we're providing this afternoon. Um, we really believe that for TIP to be successful, it's not just uh, those of us who are in TIP, but it's all of us working together across the broader ecosystem. And so we really look, look forward to continuing a dialogue that we've started with some of you previously and initiating a new dialogue that we're starting with some of you for the first time today. Um, some of you have a familiarity with TIP and some of our key programs that we'll be talking about, uh, and even some of the announcements that we've rolled out over the course of the last few uh, months, but uh, some of you may be less familiar with the directorate, uh, and so for that reason, we're going to provide a little bit of context setting as we step through the directorate, uh, the mission of the directorate, as well as some of our programmatics, but then also along the way, try to hit on some of the highlights for those of you who have been with us for this journey going back over the course of the last uh, several years, almost several years now as we progress. Um, so with that, we'll dive in. Uh, we'll start with a little bit of context about why a new director at NSF, who we are, what our mission is, how it aligns with the mission of the National Science Foundation. Uh, we'll then talk a little bit about the three pillars that we have concentrated our activities around and some of the specific programs in those pillars. Um, and then we uh, will identify ways in which we hope you can engage, regardless of sector, regardless of background, in the work that is TIP, and we'll wrap up with Q&A. I also want to acknowledge that I'm joined today by a few colleagues of mine, uh, specifically Dimitri Perkins is a program director uh, for the NSF Regional Innovation Engines program. He's actually been with us since day one as we were conceptualizing that program. Um, so he's going to provide the engines update when we get to that. Uh, also joined by Pradeep Fulai. Uh, Pradeep is the program director for uh, is a program director for the Accelerating Research Translation or ART program, uh, another of our new investment frameworks that we have, and this one specifically aligned with the Chips and Science Act legislation, like the engines program. Um, and then finally, last but certainly not least, Kelly Monteroso is our communication specialist for the TIP directorate, and she is joining us this afternoon. She's had a huge hand in some of the messaging around this directorate, uh, and she will also help us moderate Q&A uh, toward the end of the session as well. So with that, we'll dive in. 
Uh, let me first start with a little bit of a reminder of the mission for the TIP directorate, which we believe directly aligns with the mission of the National Science Foundation that we've had for more than 70 years as an agency, uh, advancing uh, research, advancing the nation's security, and so forth. Um, the mission of the TIP directorate uh, is really about trying to be able to leverage the vast and diverse talent pool that exists across all corners of our nation, really harnessing that geography of innovation, that demography of innovation, if you will, um, to be able to accelerate progress in key technology areas, accelerate progress in those technology areas that at the same time addresses some of our pressing societal and economic uh, and geostrategic challenges, really moving research results from the lab to the market and to society. And every bit as important along the way, really being able to also train the workforce of today and tomorrow for good quality, uh, good paying jobs in STEM fields and in the STEM driven economy of the mid 21st century as well. Um, when we think about the TIP directorate, we think about our role as part of the existing innovation, research and innovation ecosystem that exists across the United States today. Uh, the National Science Foundation, historically, for the better part of many decades and, and uh, even longer in some cases, has been structured into directorates or units here at NSF. Um, and those units tap into the fields of scientific inquiry and engineering that NSF has long supported, from the biological sciences to computer and information science and engineering to the social behavioral and economic sciences and so on. Um, you'll note that we cover pretty much every area of science and engineering through NSF, with the exception of medical research, since that tends to be the purview of our colleagues up the road at the National Institutes of Health. We also engage with international counterparts when appropriate. So we have an Office of International Science and Engineering, um, and we have an Office of Integrative Activities that helps lead investments that are cross-cutting, like the EPSCOR program, um, which supports jurisdictions, specific jurisdictions across the United States. When we think about the TIP directorate, we think about it as being supportive of that mission of advancing fundamental science and engineering, as well as translational science and engineering. Both of those have been every bit a part of NSF's DNA for many, many years. In fact, uh, on the translational side, for example, NSF was the first agency with a small business innovation research or SBIR program back in the 1970s and 1980s. We piloted that program for the rest of the federal government, which has since adopted it. But we really have supported that entire frontier of fundamental and translational research uniquely across all fields of science and engineering. We think of TIP as a, a new horizontal, um, really helping to strengthen and scale a part of the NSF DNA as our director, Dr. Panchanathan likes to say, um, but specifically that part that focuses in on use-inspired fundamental research as well as translational research, uh, something that the directorates of NSF prior to TIPS formation have been doing to varying degrees. But here's an opportunity for us to really be able to lift up and elevate some of that work, um, again, while at the same time ensuring that we continue to support the foundational science and engineering fundamental research that NSF has long supported and is long known for as well. Um, so over the course of the last uh, almost uh, two years, it'll be two years in March uh, of this year, uh, NSF has, through the TIP directorate, rolled out a number of new investments, a number of new activities that have lended themselves to align with the mission that I spoke of for TIP and for NSF. Uh, we've launched efforts that have focused on innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, we've launched efforts that have uh, built out partnerships with other companies, uh, other agencies, nonprofits, and foundations as well. Um, we've launched efforts to really think about the workforce and how do we bring talent to the table in a meaningful way, um, while at the same time all ensuring that we are advancing that use-inspired and translational work that is so core to the DNA of TIP and in turn the DNA of NSF. So you see on this slide and the next couple of slides some of the key milestones that we've had. Uh, for example, as we'll talk about in a bit, uh, throughout almost this entire time period, we've been on the trajectory of a series of efforts around the Regional Innovation Engines Program, announcing semifinalists, announcing finalists, announcing a partnership with the Economic Development Administration, or EDA, uh, to coordinate between our investments in the engines and their investments in their regional technology and innovation hubs or tech hubs program as well. So a whole slew of, of efforts and announcements that span uh, our portfolio of programs from the Convergence Accelerator to engines from i to SBIR and so forth. 
Um, we're excited about this entire portfolio. I'm personally excited about this entire portfolio uh, because we believe that it touches so much of this nation, uh, but it also is the thought leadership and the efforts of folks like Dimitri and Pradeep and Kelly and others in this directorate, um, whom over the course of these webinars, you uh, hopefully have an opportunity to meet, but also you get to meet as part of your engagement with TIP uh, as we proceed. And you'll see here some of the things that I'm going to highlight through the course of this webinar uh, in the last few months. Uh, efforts to uh, launch uh, our first round of uh, uh, experiential learning uh, opportunities, efforts to launch uh, the Accelerating Research Translation or ART awardees, uh, a new program focusing in on responsible design, development, and deployment of technologies, and then, of course, the 10 inaugural NSF engines that we just announced. So these are a little bit of eye candy, these three slides, but hopefully they give you a sense of the breadth and depth of the portfolio that we have been trying to unlock over the course of these last couple of years. So let me touch a little bit on uh, what we see as our core message, uh, sort of our brand within the TIP directorate within the National Science Foundation. We're really seeking to try to advance U.S. competitiveness and societal impact uh, by being able to nurture partnerships that are going to drive and accelerate three key pillars for us. One focuses in on diverse innovation ecosystems at a regional and at a national scale, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Another is trying to accelerate technology development and translation from lab to the market and to society. And I want to stress that it's lab to market and society, and I'll come back to that in a bit. Um, and then finally, it's about workforce development. And as I talked about earlier, how do we train folks at all levels, uh, K through 12, community colleges, technical schools, four-year universities, graduate schools, uh, folks who are in the workforce today looking to maybe do a pivot? How do we provide them with the competencies and the experiences to maximize uh, on their chances to succeed in the STEM-driven economy of today? Uh, and so we're going to step through each one of these three pillars in a little bit more detail, providing you with some examples, just a few examples of some of the programs, some of the activities that we currently have underway in these areas. And I'm going to start first with diverse innovation ecosystems, and we'll highlight a couple of key investments in this particular pillar. Um, the first is the NSF Convergence Accelerator. Some of you are probably familiar with the Convergence Accelerator. This actually is an example of a program that predates the establishment of TIP. Uh, NSF stood up the Convergence Accelerator back in 2019, uh, specifically to try to be able to bring together multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary research teams focused on specific societal and economic challenges, and at the same time, in some cases, technological approaches and innovations that could help address, mitigate, resolve some of those challenges through sustainable solutions that we could pursue going forward. As you think about the mission space of the Convergence Accelerator, in terms of what I just described, Hopefully you can see the alignment with the mission of the TIP directorate within NSF, which is why when we established the directorate, we brought the Convergence Accelerator into the fold within, um, within TIP and within, um, within this construct. Now, one of the things about the Convergence Accelerator, um, like many of our programs that you will hear about through the course of this webinar, uh, this funding opportunity is available to folks across sectors. So whereas NSF has historically been known for, and, and we do more than this, but we're historically known for our engagement with the academic community and institutions of higher education, um, a key focus of the Convergence Accelerator, like other programs, is to also engage private industry, to engage governments at all levels, uh, to engage nonprofits as well, because this is about trying to really bring the users and the beneficiaries of research to the table um, to help inspire the research directions and help work collaboratively on potential solutions to some of those challenges and, and pilot prototype in real world settings those solutions as well. The Convergence Accelerator typically runs with two phases. Phase one is um, uh, trying to support projects that are uh, at uh, a smaller scale, many projects at a smaller scale that are sort of in the planning phase. Phase two, uh, we do a little bit of a down select, going down to a, a, a larger number of projects, um, but uh, so, I'm sorry, a smaller number of projects, but at a larger scale on a per project basis, and really thinking about the implementation of some of the concepts that were matured during the planning phase. So over the course of the life cycle of the Convergence Accelerator to date since 2019, 
we have run what we call tracks, more than a dozen tracks, in fact, that span the waterfront in topic areas from open knowledge networks that drive the next generation of artificial intelligence technologies to novel quantum technologies to approaches that allow us to secure 5G and wireless communications to thinking about technologies that allow for persons with disabilities to become equal parts of society and really be able to engage through those technological innovations as well. Um, and you can see that some of these tracks uh, involve collaborations with other agencies. For example, DOD, the Department of Defense, helped fund the 5G uh, track G infrastructure track. Uh, and we also have partnerships with Australia and governments in the EU as well to be able to support some of the other tracks here too. Uh, I'll note that the Convergence Accelerator just ran its uh, uh, PI meeting, uh, Principal Investigators meeting, bringing together more than 500 folks from across um, a variety of different uh, backgrounds who are a part of the CA ecosystem to really bring them together and create the sort of um, community that we're trying to create with these use-inspired solutions to real-world pressing challenges from a research standpoint. So the Convergence Accelerator is on one end of the spectrum in terms of our innovation ecosystem building, and I'm going to hand it off to Dimitri to uh, begin the conversation about the Regional Innovation Engines Program, which is on the other end of that spectrum and specifically authorized by the Chips and Science Act of 2022. So Dimitri, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so hello, everyone. So the, the NSF Engines Program uh, really represents uh, uh, the full vision of, of TIP and touches on every aspect. Uh, and so when we think of an engine, uh, what we're actually funding, the program is funding, is a coalition of stakeholders with, within a region. And so we can think of the engines program as a place-based uh, innovation uh, effort. Uh, and so we launched the program just over one year ago, and uh, we recently announced uh, the first uh, cohort of 10 awardees. Uh, and unlike many other um, NSF programs where we're funding uh, a specific entity uh, organization uh, to carry out a, a, a dedicated research project, really when we think about the engines program, we are attempting to fund an entire region. And uh, the funding is intended to grow uh, and catalyze an innovation ecosystem within that region. And as I said, we funded, the, we just recently announced the first uh, cohort of 10 awardees. Uh, each of which uh, can receive up to $160 million uh, over a 10-year period. And we also uh, announced a round of development awardees. These are analogous to planning grants, and these are $1 million awards for up to two, two years. Uh, also, uh, the benefit of this program is it's open to uh, any number of uh, all types of awardees, uh, academic institutions, uh, for-profit, not-for-profit organizations, but generally for a single award, all of these entities will come together and work as a team uh, to build out the engine. And so this slide here shows the uh, all 10 awardees, and you can see uh, from this slide that we have uh, a range of uh, awardees around the country focus on different uh, technology areas. So for example, in upstate New York, we have uh, an engine focused on um, uh, energy storage. Uh, we have two engines funded in North Carolina, one focused on regenerative medicine, another on textile innovation and sustainability, uh, semiconductors in, in uh, Central Florida, uh, energy in Louisiana, uh, aerospace in El Paso, uh, the sustainability engine in the Southwest, which is uh, is headquartered in in uh, Tempe, Arizona, which focuses on energy and water sustainability, as well as some climate related issues. Uh, the Colorado engine will focus on the climate resilience. And then we have North Dakota that focuses on ag, ag tech. And also we have a water tech innovation engine uh, that's headquartered in Illinois. And so these, this represents the first round of engines uh, and Erwin, you can go to the next slide. And so really when we look at these engines, uh, NSF is, is making history and that it, this is the, the largest uh, investment um, uh, to a single awardee over a 10 year period. Uh, over a decade, this would be up to $1.6 billion uh, for all 10 awardees. Uh, 
Uh, the total number of partners involved across all 10 projects exceeds 450 partners. Uh, and those partners range from uh, uh, large industry to entrepreneurs and startups uh, to government agencies, uh, community organizations. And so every engine uh, really represents uh, a regional focus uh, and not just the, the interests of a single entity. And so while we made 10 awards, uh, those 10 awards actually span 18 states uh, across the, the uh, 10 engine awardees. And we have 69 regions represented across the entire US. Uh, another uh, key factor in distinguish, that distinguish these engines from, from uh, uh, the batch of proposals we received uh, is the amount of investment that's being made by other entities, including uh, their state and local governments, uh, private capital, are all investing within these regions uh, to, to achieve the goals laid out uh, by the proposing teams. Uh, ultimately, uh, we believe at NSF that, that these 10 engines, you know, really have the ability to, to change the face uh, of innovation within the U.S. Uh, currently, uh, I'm sure we can all think of, of a few uh, innovation ecosystems that are nationally uh, warring now within the U.S., mostly located on the coast. And so part of the goal for the engines program is, is can we increase the level and quality of innovation throughout the U.S. and take advantage of the, the talent and grow new talent uh, throughout the U.S., uh, which in turn would improve the, the competitiveness of the U.S., improve the local economy uh, for all of these funded regions. Next slide, Erwin. And so here, uh, I want to share just a few details about some of the engines that we funded, to, just to give you a sense of, of the scale and the partnerships that, that are taking place at each of these uh, funded engines. And so here, this, this represents one example of the uh, Florida Semiconductor Engine uh, located uh, near o Orlando. Um, and so fundamentally, this, this engine will focus on uh, semiconductor and in particular advanced packaging and, and manufacturing. Uh, the engine already has several uh, commitments, uh, capital commitments from their local government as, and state government. They also competed and, and was an awardee in the uh, EVA uh, Build Back Better Challenge. Uh, in a particularly uh, strong component of this engine is that uh, they already, the, the county was the owner of a uh, semiconductor manufacturing facility. Uh, they have several strong partners that occupy that, that facility. Uh, there are a number of, of partners that are engaged uh, and committed uh, to the project from academic institutions, uh, government uh, agencies. Uh, as I said, they have an industry partner, Skywater Technology, uh, that has occupied the facility and is operating the facility uh, in partnership with the universities there. Uh, and then there are several uh, nonprofit organizations that are also engaged uh, in building out uh, all of the necessary facilities and infrastructure uh, to operate and, and grow the regional innovation ecosystem uh, within uh, Central Florida. Next slide, Owen. And here, uh, then just to show you kind of uh, the, the uh, various scales of, of the various engines that we have funded, the previous uh, engine focused on a single county uh, in the state of Florida. Uh, in this case, we have uh, the North Dakota Advanced Agriculture Technology Engine, uh, which uh, in their region of service spans the entire state of North Dakota. Uh, and typically this would you know, the choice of the region of service may depend on the um, population size and a number of other factors. Um, and so here, this center will focus primarily uh, on advanced ag technology uh, involving crop genomics, climate modeling, uh, data capture, sensors, drones. So they have a, a number of advanced technology areas that this center, that this engine uh, would, would touch. Uh, and as you can see, uh, given this, the uh, size of the region of service, uh, they have a significant number of partners 
Uh, and to be qualified as a partner means that you, you're contributing um, to the engine in cash or in kind, uh, or you're participating as part of the governance structure. So here we see that we have 14 academic institutions, 32 industry partners. Uh, also significant to this uh, engine is there are five uh, tribal organizations that are also part of the engine and that would uh, make contributions and benefit from the from the outcomes of of this engine. Next slide, Erwin. So again, we have another engine that uh, the region of service spans the entire state. Uh, the Louisiana Energy Transition Engine uh, will focus on uh, the transition to carbon energy. Uh, as as many of you know, um, Louisiana, Texas, the the Gulf Coast is 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 well known for for oil and gas and energy energy related um, uh, sectors, industry sectors. And so uh, this particular engine will focus on uh, those regions of, in Louisiana, both North and South Louisiana, that will focus on uh, kind of uh, the transition uh, technology. And so this is very important to this region of the country. Um, there are 49 partners uh, spanning academic uh, uh, industry partnerships. Uh, it's very significant that Exxon and Shell and partners such as this, as well as a number of mid-size uh, oil and gas companies are partners, all partners within this, this engine. Um, uh, one of the key components of, of the engine leadership uh, in most all of these engines, in particular this engine, is bringing together industry partners that are competitors, um, but uh, helping uh, the entire region recognize the the advantage of working together um, and identifying what the common interests are and and growing the innovation ecosystem um, beyond the interests of just individual individual companies and so this engine represents uh, uh, one of those engines that will work hard to to satisfy that as a goal uh, so so this slide uh, reflects the the partnership network uh, that have formed and, and continues to form across uh, all of the engines. Uh, as I mentioned previously, there are uh, across all 10 engines, there are well over 450 partners. Uh, and this is this is quite significant and uh, and seeing how the engines, even in this early stage, uh, have already begun to uh, develop uh, the cross sector uh, network of stakeholders uh, that will serve as uh, Infrastructure support, provide capital investments, uh, will provide workforce development uh, initiatives to actually grow and continue to see uh, the, the the efforts of the engine itself. And so this you can you can access all of this information uh, at the engine's website. Uh, I'm sure Kelly can probably drop the link to the website uh, in the chat. Uh, but all of this information is available via the web. Uh, the engine's website and you can view the actual partners associated with with each engine uh, and their roles within the engine uh, and, and all of this information is available via the web. So one other thing that we, we think is very important uh, to point out, uh, all of the engines will focus on uh, various uh, key technology uh, areas as highlighted, for example, in the Chips and Science Act. Uh, here we have 10 that are listed, and, and as you read this, this table, uh, what this means is of the 10, uh, the dark blue means of the, ten, of the 10 engines that we funded, seven uh, will uh, focus on artificial intelligence, four will focus on advanced computing and semiconductors, one uh, will have a focus on quantum uh, information science and technology, and so you can see that that we have uh, the engines cover all of the technology areas. The light blue uh, represents the uh, technology areas that are covered by our current uh, development awardees, of which there are 59 development awardees who will likely be competing in the next round of the, the engines program. Uh, but the key uh, highlight to take away here is, you know, all of these engines funded across the U.S. Uh, will to some degree uh, be advancing key technology areas 
um, across all the key technology areas uh, uh, associated with the Chips and Science Act. An important component to the engines program, uh, as I mentioned, the, the objective here is, is not just to focus on a single uh, research project, uh, but really to advance the entire region uh, innovation ecosystem, and which is a very challenging task. And so part of the engines program, uh, we're, we're launching what we call the engines builder platform. Uh, and this platform <clears throat> is being led by uh, the engine accelerator, uh, which is uh, originated out of uh, M MIT. And uh, just to summarize, I mean, the, the platform will provide technical assistance and support to all of the engines. The technical assistant could range from uh, recruiting the necessary talent, recruiting CEOs for the engine, uh, providing access uh, or, uh, to networks where, uh, where you have access to uh, uh, capital investments, uh, to developing efforts and initiatives around diversity and inclusion. So there are a range of services that will be provided uh, to each of the engine awardees uh, to further help and assist uh, those, those uh, organizations to be to be successful in carrying out their their mission. And I think that's it, Irvin. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dimitri. Hopefully folks can see the excitement that we have for what Dimitri and the rest of the engines team uh, have been able to do over the course of the last couple of years working on this program. Uh, I'm going to touch on a couple more pieces of our innovation ecosystem portfolio, uh, particularly the Enhancing Partnerships to Increase Innovation Capacity, or EPIC program, as we like to call it. This actually dovetails with the engines program that you just heard Dimitri talk about, um, really about trying to be able to engage diverse institutions and diverse institution types that are maybe up and coming in terms of their research portfolios uh, in their local innovation ecosystems, including potentially in NSF regional innovation engines or the development awards that we're funding. Um, this is predicated on the fact that we had a number of conversations with um, uh, MSIs, uh, uh, community colleges and technical schools, primarily undergraduate institutions, even before the launch of the engines program to try to better understand um, how we could create opportunities for all different types of institutions to engage in, in the program. Um, and through those conversations, we took away some, some lessons learned, if you will, or some potential opportunities or, or steps that we could take. And this particular program is one of those to really work closely with potential proposers um, to help shape their proposals uh, in some way, provide mentoring and guidance and coaching as they're shaping their proposals um, so that they can be more competitive in terms of being able to acquire the resourcing that they could benefit from to grow capacity and in turn become a part of an innovation engine, really building that partnership to being a part of the innovation engine. Um, we recently awarded almost $20 million uh, worth of investment to nearly 50 teams. Uh, you can see the deadline for the next company Petition coming up later this spring, as a matter of fact, for another round of EPIC awards. And I'll highlight, um, just taking a quick look at the map uh, of the projects that we have funded uh, under the EPIC program, uh, community colleges, master's colleges, baccalaureate colleges, um, and so forth. And you can see sort of their, the geographic location um, of the lead institutions, as well as the collaborative or partnering institutions that have been engaging as well. Again, the goal here to try to get more institutions to become a part of their local and regional innovation ecosystems and economies, including potentially the NSF engines program as well. Um, let me now transition to talking a bit about technology translation and development, our second pillar. Um, and here, I think it's really important to emphasize that we are very interested in the full spectrum of opportunity from lab to market and society. So oftentimes when one thinks about technology translation, one tends to think about lab to market and particularly new startups and small businesses and so forth. And in fact, as I mentioned earlier, we're really proud of the fact that at NSF, we have a long history of supporting startups and small businesses that have led to new companies that today are, are well-known commodities like Qualcomm, for example. But that being said, there are other pathways to translational impact as well. Uh, and it's also important for us to build capacity for those pathways too. So for instance, we've seen that in certain trade spaces, 
uh, open source ecosystems can offer a competitive advantage vis-a-vis -vis some closed box approaches um, that folks might take. And so there's an opportunity for us, we believe, um, to really think about what are those additional pathways and what types of resourcing and what types of training can we provide to talent, to researchers, to students, to others. For instance, to be able to scale research coming out of the education space, uh, education research, to really be able to start to translate that into classrooms, into formal and informal settings, um, and really scale that across the country as well. So what are those various pathways and how can we provide resourcing to be able to support that? Uh, so I'm going to highlight a couple of these pathways. One is the proverbial lab to market pathway. Um, so starting about a decade ago, actually a little over a decade ago now, NSF launched a program called i or Innovation Core, which is really about trying to be able to provide experiential entrepreneurial education to folks interested in trying to go down that particular pathway. That education is really centered around customer discovery. Uh, how can I find the niche for the concept that I have? Is there a market for the concept that I have that I'm thinking about potentially translating into practice? Um, so over the course of the last several years, NSF has funded uh, 10 uh, innovation core hubs, I-Core hubs, distributed across the country. You see the states that they cover in the gold coloring on the right-hand side of the chart, primarily led by academic institutions and involving nearly 100 universities altogether. Um, we have a new funding opportunity for i -Core that we have just issued. Uh, with a deadline that's coming up uh, uh, later this spring. Um, and our goal with that particular funding opportunity is to really fill in some of the blank spaces, if you will, that you see on that map, really trying to hone in on specific communities and regions and states, particularly jurisdictions, um, that we have not yet covered by virtue of the i -Core hubs that we have funded to date. We are also always seeking out teams, i -Core teams, uh, to come into the i -Core, um, ecosystem. Um, these are uh, folks who are thinking about taking that technology to market. Uh, we provide $50,000 of funding on a per team basis uh, for the seven week uh, um, curriculum that folks step through as part of the i -Core program. Um, relatedly, but kind of taking it to the next step then, is a program that we call America's Seed Fund, powered by NSF, or uh, the combination of the Small Business Innovation Research and Small Business Technology Transfer, or SBIR, STTR programs. Um, this is really about allowing for folks to pursue that deep tech startup, uh, really do that feasibility assessment, if you will, of taking that scientific or engineering discovery and turning it into a product or service with commercial and societal impact. You can see that we support projects in three phases, phase one, phase two, phase two B at varying levels and durations of support. Um, you can engage with the SBIR STTR program today by submitting a project pitch through our website. We will aim to get back to you with feedback on that project pitch to see if it aligns with the NSF instantiation of the SBIR STTR program, our goals for this program, um, within a matter of weeks to try to get you feedback and then to get you down the path of being able to submit a proposal or recognizing that the alignment isn't there for the NSF SBIR STTR programs. One thing that I'll emphasize, our SBIR STTR programs are really focused in specifically on the earliest stage startups and deep tech startups at that. Um, we tend to fund teams that are quite small um, and really try to kickstart them and catapult them onto the path to success, uh, whether it be an acquisition or growing into a much larger enterprise into the future. Um, so that's the lab to market trajectory, if you will, i -Core, SBIR, STTR, and some other programs that we have as well to, to help try to fill in that, that gap between the lab and, and societal impact. Another translational pathway that I referenced earlier is about open source ecosystems. Um, and the program here that I'd emphasize is Pathways to Enable Open Source Ecosystems, or POSE. This is an effort that we actually launched even prior to the establishment of TIP, just prior to the establishment of TIP, um, where the goal is to be able to try to provide the resourcing and the training that allows for teams to really turn their research result into an open source ecosystem and a sustainable and potentially high impact one at that, um, that allows for continued 
contributions from a community uh, of developers or practitioners um, that really allows for that technology base to continue to mature going forward. Uh, you could imagine coming out of these open source ecosystems, spinoffs that could turn into their own startups and small businesses, for example. Um, so a lot of potential uh, cultivation of competitiveness um, and growth through these efforts as well. Like the SBIR STTR program, in fact, maybe slightly modeled off of that even, we provide support through two phases, phase one and phase two. Uh, and this opportunity is open to folks in academia, to industry, as well as to nonprofits too. Uh, with that, I'm going to transition to uh, talking about some of the capacity building efforts that we have. So you've heard of two translational pathways, um, and, and there are others that we are seeking to build out as well. But we're also very keenly interested, and Congress has asked us to be so, uh, in capacity building. And so here I'm going to transition to Pradeep to talk a little bit about a new program that we're also excited about, the ART program. So Pradeep, over to you. Thank you, Arvind. So it's my pleasure to welcome everybody. Arvind, thank you for the leadership you provide for TIP Directorate. So uh, people who may not be familiar, ART is a brand new program. Uh, it stands for Accelerating Research Translation. And in the big picture, what we are really trying to do with this program is really support institutes of higher education that have had the amount or volume of research that has been very high However, the outcomes in terms of translational activities, uh, there are multiple ways to measure it. Those have been on the low side. And very recently in December, we announced 18 teams that got funded. Uh, we have invested more than $100 million into these teams to really boost their capacity, their ability to elevate the level of translational research on campuses. Let's go to the next slide, please. So in a nutshell, right, if you look at this uh, chart, uh, on the x-axis, you have overall research of at, uh, that is happening uh, at an academic uh, institution. And then on the y-axis, you have the translational activities. And if you look at the bottom left corner, that there's a blue ellipse. Those are institutions where both of those uh, parameters, meaning the overall research as well as translational activities, are on the smaller side. So those might be smaller universities, smaller colleges, community colleges, et cetera. And then the green ellipse that you see on the right top corner, those are institutions that already have high level of research accompanied by high level of translational activities. And again, translational activities could be measured by number of startups, invention disclosures, industry partnerships, number of research centers on campus, industry university type uh, settings. So there are multiple ways to measure that. So those institutions are not the target of art. Instead, if you look at the golden ellipse, uh, those are the institutes of higher education, uh, wherein uh, if you look at their research funding, the volume of research, number of publications, graduate students, et cetera, that has been pretty high. So the x-axis is high, but on the y-axis, for whatever reasons, uh, if you look at their translational output, that is pretty low. So those are the institutions that are the target of this art program. And, and we are working uh, to see how these institutions, with the help of art program, how can they move in the direction of the green ellipse? That means how can they uh, increase substantially their translational activities? So. Our program is very unique in that we recently, as I mentioned before, we awarded 18 um, uh, institutions in December. They are all across the nation out of 18. As you can see, as this chart shows, we have nine institutions that are uh, in, in EPSCOR jurisdictions. We have seven institutions in which we have a woman uh, that is uh, the principal investigator for these projects. Uh, and again, uh, there is a range of partnerships here. Uh, and one of the unique features of art is really that we have uh, uh, institutes of higher education that already have a robust translational ecosystem. Those institutions are really part uh, of partnership or they are partner institutions. We call them mentoring institutions. Let's go to the next view graph. 
So this is about art and I'm handing over back to you. I'll hand it over back to you, Arvind, for describing the newest programs that we have. Thank awesome. you. Thanks very much, Pradeep. Thanks for doing that. And and as I think you heard in Pradeep's um, uh, voice and excitement there, I think this is a this is something that Congress encouraged us to do with with art, but it's also something that we take great pride and excitement in in trying to be able to work with the universities directly to grow that capacity and help accelerate translational research more generally throughout the U.S. Um, I'm going to transition to one last uh, highlight within the technology translation development portfolio, and that is a new initiative that we launched, as, as Pradeep mentioned, um, just a few weeks ago called Responsible Design, Development, and Deployment of Technologies, or Red Dot for short. Um, we're excited to be collaborating here with uh, five philanthropic partners, um, the Siegel Family Endowment, the McGovern Foundation, the Ford Foundation, Pivotal Ventures, and also Schmidt Futures, um, really focusing in on trying to be able to contemplate the ethical, legal, community, and societal considerations that are associated with essentially the entire life cycle of a technology's creation and use. Uh, you see this in every one of the key technology areas that um, was called out in the Chips and Science legislation. And by the way, this particular program has its roots in a section that's also called out in the Chips and Science legislation under the TIP umbrella. Um, but if you look at each of those key technology areas, really an emphasis in those areas around from AI to quantum to biotech and so forth, around really thinking through what are the uh, guardrails that we should be conceptualizing from even the initial design point, even the conceptualization phase, let alone once we have designed and developed a technology and once we're trying to think about contemplating its broader use and consumption. So um, this is an effort where we have a deadline coming up later this spring, $16 million investment that leverages NSF, TIP resources, um, uh, and other directorates too, together with that of other foundations uh, in the private sector. Um, so with that as the first two pillars, I'm going to transition to a, a third and final pillar that we emphasize in TIP, which is around workforce development. Um, and as I alluded to earlier, our key focus here within TIP is, is less about research on education, which tends to be the purview of our colleagues in the STEM Education Directorate at NSF, uh, and it has been for quite some time, but really learning from that research to understand what are the uh, uh, innovations that we can then pursue and try to scale uh, regionally and nationally to be able to grow talent at every level from K through 12 to today's workforce um, and, and across that entire spectrum. Um, and so one of our flagship efforts here is the Experiential Learning for Emerging and Novel Technologies or Excellent Program uh, that we launched uh, about a year plus ago now, really trying to be able to coalesce partnerships within a particular region, uh, focusing in on a key technology area um, that allows for us to be able to bring academia, but also industry and governments and nonprofits together in such a way that we can identify and make available to talent today whether enrolled in a degree or certificate program or not, but make available to talent internships, apprenticeships, and other practical experiential opportunities for that talent. Um, we see those experiential opportunities as a springboard that allows for that talent, again, whether in a degree or certificate program or not, to potentially be able to pivot into a key technology space and pursue that key technology space in terms of a future job, a future career prospect, um, could become so excited that they then do pursue a degree or certificate program, for instance, uh, and be able to leverage all of that to, to get a higher wage, better quality job going forward. Um, we invested in the first round of the excellent program uh, um, in the last few months, about a $19 million investment to 27 projects. You can see the locations of these projects on this map. You can see the topic areas that they, that they uh, encompass from quantum to biotech to advanced manufacturing and robotics and so forth. Um, and you can also see the diverse institution types that have come together um, as part of these coalitions to, to work collaboratively to drive forward the progress in these various regions around experiential learning. Um, I'll also emphasize another dimension of our workforce development, really concentrating in on entrepreneurship uh, and trying to be able to provide folks with uh, entrepreneurial experiences as well. Um, so the Activate organization, activate.org, has been around for a few years, uh, has supported cohorts of entrepreneurial fellows in specific locations across the country. 
um, a few, uh, about a year ago or so, we announced a partnership with them through a cooperative agreement where we're going to expand their reach and really think about Activate Anywhere. Um, so trying to be able to harness that talent from all different corners of the country and give folks, regardless of geographic location, the ability to have that practical experience of being able to move technologies from lab to market. You can think of this a little bit like post i uh, with us providing a couple of years of support, stipends, plus access to research facilities and equipment, plus access to the business and capital networks that allow folks to take part in that effort to go from lab to market uh, and hopefully have that experience uh, and, and learnings to be able to then repeat that down the road in the future um, with other endeavors that they might pursue uh, as well. And finally, I'll highlight this effort that um, we launched just in the last uh, little while here, uh, collaboration with the Council of Graduate Schools, or CGS. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the Council of Graduate Schools, um, a coalition that's that's been around for quite some time and uh, has done a lot of data collection work um, to help inform uh, decision making that takes place when it comes to higher education. Um, well, we are investing in them to be able to collect more data from an additional a set of universities um, to be able to leverage that data-driven decision-making to address some of the perennial challenges that we've seen in recruiting and retaining domestic graduate students who have traditionally been underrepresented in STEM fields. So trying to better understand that, trying to better understand the opportunities there, and try to better understand actionable insights and directions that we could take to, again, try to be able to harness the full geography and demography um, of talent that exists all and innovation that exists all across this country going forward. So I hope across these three pillars, you can see our keen interest in trying to really be able to accelerate research to impact. Um, we will make these slides and we will make this webinar available on the web uh, afterwards, but wanna highlight on this particular slide for the different sectors that intersect with the TIP directorate at NSF, from academia to industry to government to nonprofits, the variety of programs that, and program offerings that are available to each of these sectors. Uh, in some cases, the program available across multiple sectors. Really encourage you to sort of dig in and better understand the opportunity that aligns with uh, where you're coming from and your interests and where you are in terms of trying to be able to accelerate research to impact and further use-inspired and translational research going forward as well. Um, and finally, um, I invite all of you to, just as some of you have done to get to this webinar today, please sign up for our newsletter. Uh, please check out our website, new.nsf.gov slash tip slash latest. Um, we, we welcome the ability to engage with you through our web platform to hear from you um, and to communicate with you about some of our latest news and some of our latest exciting announcements as well. Um, so with that, we'll pause here uh, and I invite folks um, to chime in with any additional questions in the q and I'll hand things over to Kelly for the last few minutes that we have to help us moderate our Q&A and answer any remaining questions that we didn't get to. I saw we had lots of questions coming in through the course of this webinar. Thank you for those. Uh, I hope uh, some of you got your questions answered through the Q&A, but we look forward to engaging with you in a dialogue here as well. So Kelly, I'll kick it over to you. Hi, everyone, and thanks, Erwin. Um, I think I've gotten to most of the questions. I'm just trying to, I've been furiously writing. <laughs> um, but I guess here's one. Um, I don't want to go too far into the leads. Um, Okay, here's one from John Cohen. Where might I find more contact information for the SBR STTR program directors to learn how to make my proposal more competitive? Yeah, thanks for that question, John. So um, I'd encourage folks to go to NSF, uh, new.nsf.gov slash tip slash latest. You can from there click into our SBIR STTR website. We have a dedicated webpage, uh, I believe it's seedfund.nsf.gov. And you can, through that webpage, connect in with program officers um, and 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 get their input. Again, I, I strongly encourage folks to go through the pitch process. Um, you can submit multiple pitches. You do have to wait a little bit from one pitch and feedback on that until the next opportunity opens up on a quarterly basis effectively. Um, but, but we do encourage you to go through the pitch process because it's our means of trying to be able to get you 
relatively rapid response uh, in terms of feedback as to the alignment between your pitch and the NSF SBIRS TTR program. Uh, we implemented that a few years ago, mostly to have to minimize folks having to write full detailed proposals, um, only to find that the alignment may not have been as strong as they or we would have liked to see. Can I, can I quickly, Erwin, can I quickly yep. add something, which I think what is also helpful is uh, if you, uh, SBIR program directors are always looking for panelists, and if you can find a way to be on the panel, that I think can be very educational, that can be very informative, and that's a great way to learn how to make your own proposal competitive whenever you are ready to submit it. So both what Irvin said, I think that is very helpful. And, and you can also try to see if you could be on one of the review panels for any of our programs, not just SBI or STTR. Yeah, thanks, Pradeep. Actually, that last point, I think, is really important for any of our programs. Underscore that point. Absolutely. OK, here's a question from Cedric. Philip, uh, can you apply to the NSF SBR phase one and to excellent? and maybe talk about applying to multiple programs. Yeah, so I'll try to take that one and Pradeep and Dimitri and Kelly, feel free to add in as well. So, so you can apply to multiple programs concurrently. Uh, uh, if you look at an individual funding opportunity, for example, you will see some specific eligibility criteria that are in effect for that particular funding opportunity. So for instance, many of our programs um, indicate that you can only apply to a given deadline uh, as PI, co-PI, or senior personnel uh, on some number of applications to that program. So maybe it's one, maybe it's two, et cetera. Uh, but applying across multiple programs is perfectly acceptable. I think the key point here that I would emphasize, which I'm sure, Cedric, you can appreciate and others can appreciate, but I still, to do my job, have to emphasize it. You want to apply with distinct uh, goals, distinct activities that you would undertake pursuant to those multiple proposals. So obviously your proposal on excellent would focus on experiential learning opportunities and making those available. Your proposal on SBIR would correspond to standing up a new startup small business and the R&D that that, that that entails. Um, so you just want to make sure that your swim lanes are distinct between what you're proposing to do across multiple proposals, but you can apply concurrently across multiple programs. Thank you, Erwin. Um, there have been a few questions about upcoming deadlines for engines. Do you have any information to share? Yeah, that's. I was expecting that to be the first question out of the gate, actually. So um, I'll 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 say that um, uh, Dimitri and team, and Dimitri, you should feel free to weigh in. Uh, are are actively working on the next round of the engines program, subject to appropriations and so forth, as always. Um, but we are anticipating, we are hopeful to be able to move in the direction of getting another uh, funding opportunity for the next round out sometime later this spring, uh, uh, later this spring, early summer timeframe. Uh, and you can anticipate that we would try to provide time for folks to prepare their proposals, et cetera. Um, so we would set deadlines accordingly um, to give folks and the community enough time to respond and react to that. Dimitri, is that fair? Anything you want to add or correct? Nope, that's correct. Uh, I see some more, I guess, specific questions about is it, will it be FY24? But I think you, you answered that. So all of those will get answered, but yes. Thank you. Um, and then I think I think we only have time for one last question, maybe two. Um, but can you, uh, from David uh, Nguyen, what are you envisioning for four use-inspired research funding opportunities in the future? So can you give us a little teaser about what might be coming? Yeah, so thanks, Kelly, and thanks, David, for that question. Um, so I'd encourage folks to really, in some sense, take a look at the Chips and Science Act legislation and the law that um, is, has now passed and is law of the land. Um, the Chips and Science Act specifically has a section focused on the TIP directorate, and within that um, within that section, it calls out subsections that correspond to investments. Um, so, for example, the regional innovation engines is called out there. Uh, section 10391, I don't know why I know that, but Section 10391 corresponds to the text that um, uh, led us to establish the ART program. Uh, I think 10398 corresponds to what is now the Red Dot program. So I'd encourage you to take a look at that because that gives you a flavor for um, some of the specific investment types that we are contemplating. Um, some of it now is, of course, subject to appropriations. 
Um, the other thing that I'll say is that we are um, we we are trying to build out a portfolio of use inspired and translational work that is in alignment with each of the key technology areas that are called out in the chips and science legislation. Um, we have over the course of the last several months pulled together, brought in a team of folks looking at AI, looking at quantum, looking at biotech, and then also having conversations with other directorates and uh, in some cases, other agencies and private sector partners to really understand what might be a sweet spot of investment for TIP to be able to accelerate progress from the foundational sciences into translation and into practice. And so we'll have much more to say about some of those investments. In fact, you might hear or see some of those in the not too distant future uh, as starting points, uh, but we'll have more to say about that over the course of the next several months. Okay, I think we're at time. Um, if you do have some pending questions in the chat, feel free to send them to tip at nsf.gov and we'll do our best to answer them promptly. All right. Thank you, Kelly. And let me again thank everybody for your time today. I uh, really appreciate your interest in TIP and your engagement in TIP. Uh, and we look forward to hearing from you and working with you as we continue to build out this directorate, our programs, and really aspire to have the impact that uh, we hope to have with the mission that is TIP. So thanks very much, everybody. Thank you.